right, guys. Um, so Willie, Willie's got a question. Willie says, I think a great topic is always inventory and when it can be done. Does it have to be done at time of tow or can it be done several hours after tow in an impound without warrant? So Willie, first things first, man. Um, for me, I always refer to them as inventories, right? I never refer to them as inventory searches because I need to keep it clear in my mind that I'm not doing a search and a search has a legal definition and an inventory is not a search. And so I never refer to them as searches when I testify I never refer to them as searches in my report. Um, that just helps me keep it straight in my mind, right? Because the concern is, is that we are going to lose inventory because officers are abusing it. Inventory cannot be a subterfuge for an investigatory purpose. It cannot be a mere pretext. And so basically, if you are doing anything that makes it look like you are using inventory to get around the Fourth Amendment, then courts are going to hold that it is not an inventory. And if you don't have PC uh, or if you don't have some other recognized exception, then it's going to anything you find in there is going to be suppressed. And so to simple answer your question, if you are purely doing an inventory, the only reason to do an inventory is to safeguard valuables. And so if you are towing the vehicle and then inventorying it several hours later at the impound lot, that is not an inventory. That is a search because the rationale for inventory does not uh, support that practice. All right. Hold on. <laughs> So let's have, I, I like to hear what Zach thinks about this too, but I got to tell you that I actually tell my cops, you know, when I'm teaching to not really shy away from the word search as much, I think they get, because I mean, you did say, just push, just uh, to push this envelope, you did say that inventories are not searches. Now that's obviously not directly correct, right? I mean, not, because if it's not a search, that's not a Fourth Amendment issue, right, John? But that's not what you mean. Well, so, so, I mean, basically what we're doing here is, is we're not, we're not searching, right? Because I'm, I mean, well, I'm going into an item with the attempt to gain information and that's not what I'm doing. Well, but, but you are searching. You're searching. You just said yourself, you're searching for what though? You're not searching for evidence. You're searching for what? You're searching for dangerous items and things that are valuable so that we don't get falsely accused. Right. So, I mean, just to be fair, isn't it? Strictly speaking, a search, because if it's not a search, it doesn't fall into the Fourth Amendment. Would you agree with that, at least? I would agree with the statement that if it's not a search, it doesn't fall into the Fourth Amendment. But again, what courts routinely say that the individual's subjective intent is irrelevant, right? And yet, if you are using inventory, if your subjective intent is to conduct this for an investigatory purpose, well, then it's not a valid inventory. And so in that case, an individual's subjective intent absolutely does matter. And so yeah, I said, so, yeah, subjective intent matters on inventories, right? Correct. It does, yes. But it's still a search. Yeah, but so Zach, do you, how do you teach this? Because again, I, I I don't teach it like John does, and I just want to kind of let our audience know because a lot of people have seen my class. Like, wait a minute, Anthony does say there's searches, but they're just like a pat down as a search. It's just a very narrow search. But how do you teach it, Zach? Yeah, I teach it as as being a search um, in in the in the constitutional sense of the word. I mean, we're, it's not it's a it's a community caretaking type of administrative type of a search. It's not a investigative search. But uh, under the under under either the Katz or the Jones Hardinus definition of a search, um, it's 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 a physical intrusion into a constitutionally protected area with the intent to gather information, which is in this case, what are the contents of the vehicle? And but I, I agree also that the the motive the officer's motive is relevant um in determining the lawfulness of the inventory a hundred percent i think that's what john's making a good point is that I think and john you said that's that, point, yes yeah no, and then, exactly I, I see i see his point but i i just i do know there's going to be cops out there they're like wait a minute you know you know it, it, how can it not be a search and that's not what we mean it's a search for evidence and subjectiveness does i think we're all on the same page there. Right. And I, I guess, you know, at the end of the day, it's semantics. My point is, I don't ever want anybody using it for an investigatory search. And so if I call it an yeah. inventory, right. then it's always going to be clear in my mind, why are we in this vehicle? And what are we doing? We are looking. Uh, I agree. Yep. Right. Yeah, I, don't, I don't disagree with that at all. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I agree and... with that totally. I agree with that totally. Yeah, I, I, oh, it's just yeah. like calling a path down a path down. We don't, you know, we don't search the person. I mean, we I guess we can say we're searching for weapons, but really, we're, 
that wouldn't be healthy because search implies more exploratory, right? So, yep. yeah, okay. I think we're all on the same page, but anyway, I just want to throw in my two cents. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I appreciate it. I'm just telling you, we're going to lose, we're going to lose inventory and I see it coming out of Colorado through the 10th circuit. Yeah. Ask well, uh, the I, state I, of I, Iowa. Iowa yeah, I, Iowa's lost it. Uh, California actually has not lost it, but they, they do have a, a case of the Supreme court, California, that makes it a lot more restrictive, but all these courts, they want legit reasons. I mean, you, you talked about that. Uh, you reiterate that many times, John, in the, in the presentation where like, you know, cops are saying things that are catchphrases, you know, and, you know, high crime area, furtive movements, and they don't, they don't mean much without explanation. And it's the same thing with these community caretaking cases. The courts want reasons, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Um, okay, so Jacob says, brother kills brother, family won't talk, can't detain. What do you do? Jacob, I think this is a great question, right? And it, it actually goes to one of the questions that uh, an, an officer submitted on our website. What do you do? And I'll tell you, this is really frustrating for a lot of people because I have officers coming to me and they say, well, hey, our prosecutors, I mean, we have forms that we have to fill out, right? And so if our prosecutors see that the, like, the witness information is left blank, they'll just automatically dismiss this. And so they have to, witnesses have to identify themselves to us. And I said, they don't, right? I mean, they, they don't, witnesses don't have to, if they're not suspects, if you're not detaining them, you're not going to, you know, take them into custody and require them to, to identify themselves to you. Um, you're opening up a can of worms there. Zach, what yeah, do you think? And, you and this is, this would be more for, uh, you know, a prosecutor to, to address, but you know, there's also the, in states that allow the special grand jury, the investigative grand jury, you can compel witnesses to, uh, testify there. Um, that's yep. but that's your prosecutor absolutely has to be involved in that process. But yeah, if if on, on the scene, if the witness doesn't want to identify him or herself, I I can't really think of any lawful basis for requiring that person to do that or subjecting them to some kind of sanction if they don't do it. Right, and that's tough, right? Because we know through the court process we can subpoena them. Prosecutors can compel them to testify. Absolutely, but how do we get their personal information so that the prosecutor can subsequently compel them? I get it. It's a cash 22, but officers don't want to be on the bad end of that, right? We don't want to be re-victimizing victims because we need them for the court process. And if the prosecutor turns it down because you don't have all the witness information because your witness or your victim is refusing to provide that information to you, don't get yourself jammed up over it. Okay. Leobardo Jimenez says, can you help me understand search incident to citations? <laughs> when can we and can we not search people when we cite them for misdemeanor crimes? Zach, do you want to do you want to open yeah. that up, man? And it, it is quite the can of worms, I would agree. This is this is a tough one. And I and and I've I've done some research on it and I really haven't found a whole lot of case law to support one way or the other maybe anthony has something but you know um so we have Knowles versus iowa uh which is kind of our guidepost here where the supreme court says the 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 authority to do a search incident to arrest that automatic authority that comes with with every lawful custodial arrest does not extend to cite and release situations so if we're citing in a field and releasing someone, uh, we don't get that automatic right to search them for weapons or evidence, um, relate, well, evidence in general, uh, destructible evidence. But Knowles also doesn't say you could never do a search incident to citation. It just says they won't extend the bright line rule. So, um, well, one, if we think they have a weapon on them, that's easy. You can just pat them down under Terry. Uh, because we, I'm, I'm assuming we have a lawful detention if we're if we're writing citations to people, um, so we do have the, rec the the Terry requirements. But as far as searching them for evidence, um, I've kind of gone back and forth on this one, and I'm uh, right now I'm of the position that if if you have a reason to believe this person has evidence on their person relevant to whatever it is you're citing them for, I think there is some potential support for for that that limited search for that limited purpose. 
Like if I believe they've got stolen merchandise, it's shoplifting is where this comes up frequently. Maybe they stole allegedly a, a DVD. If, if those are even if these if those are even a thing anymore, I don't know. But you know, you know, it's a rather large item. I think you could you could conduct a limited search of that person and perhaps any carried belongings they have accessible to them, uh, looking for that that item. But um, okay, I, I, yeah, Anthony. Okay, look, I, I absolutely. So I, I want to maybe uh, add a few pointers here. Number one is, I think part of the problem that cops get confused on is that there is this old old adage that a citation is in lieu of arrest. You, we've all heard that. It's a, it's, it, it really does not move the ball forward because what does that even mean, right? Um, and some courts have used that language, you know, citation in lieu of arrest. And then some of our officers who are not legally trained, they think, well, since it's an arrest, I get a search instant to arrest. I think that's one problem. The second thing is, is that it's really not search instant to citation is because Knowles obviously handled that. It's agency searches. And that's what you're talking about with the with the shoplifting case. Right, Zach? It's um, it's what, I, I'm, I think there's I'm distinguishing between the two, but I think that's a very viable alternate argument. The exigent circumstances. Well, what would be if, if it was an agency and you're not going to make the arrest? Right. Right. And it, you, it, they will not give you the consent. Well, then what would you say to the court about what is the recognized exception then? The Just for evidence, the, the search. Uh, it's well, it's effectively a search incident to arrest without an arrest is is the exception that I I think there's there's an argument for. Um, without getting in, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, well, I'll say without getting into Rawlings issues. Uh, you know the search that precedes the the arrest, the search yeah. that precedes the arrest. Right, uh, right. That's an all, another way to go. I think there's some language in in Robinson, Chamel, and even Gantt that I think, uh, uh, and in Knowles as well, that a limited search for evidence related to the offense of the citation could be lawful. Yeah. Well, look, I think that the the vast majority because I've done this is the million dollar question. This is the this is the one the one area of the law right that quite frankly, if, if the Supreme Court asked me. Hey, what do you want us to clear up? This would absolutely be it, right? This whole I would agree. Yep. Certain, yep, it, it, it comes up all the time. And now the thing is, you know, with my research, and I've been trying to figure out this for for years, quite frankly, is it? I think most courts are going back ultimately to what case uh, was it? Uh, Murphy versus Cup. Do I have that right? Is it Cup versus Murphy? But Cup um, versus they go back. Cup versus Murphy. They go back to that case, which is for our listeners, it is that case where the husband was interviewed about his 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 wife's death. They did notice that he had, you know, blood, you know, and maybe some fibers under his fingernails. They basically held his hand down. They recovered those fibers. Ultimately, it was forensically, you know, um, linked to the wife and they did not arrest him. And the court obviously upheld it as reasonable. But why did they uphold it? You know, for agency purposes, destruction of evidence. Let's fast forward to 2024. You know, if you've got this person who's shoplifted, right, and they have whatever they have in their backpack, and you're in most states, not most, I, but many states cannot even make that arrest because it's a misdemeanor and so forth. Yeah, you can maybe do a citizen's arrest, but even then it's limited. So what are you going to do? And, and let's say the LP, the loss prevention, has not recovered their uh, their items. Yes, we, we are going to – we can help I, – I believe we can help recover that that stolen property – it, but if it's limited, just like you said, and there should be the cops should have something to say about why it's there is agency, I, because that's what, in my view, that's what these courts want to hear. And it's as simple as, look, your honor, if I don't grab this evidence now, I'm sorry, this stolen property now, you'll never see it again. And what's the alternative to arrest them, which you, you, that's more intrusive, right, or hold mm -hmm. them for a search warrant, which is going to take seven hours in some places. So I just think that I, I found a case um, out of the Ninth Circuit that talked about. The fact that they are going to be let go is the agency. Yeah. And I'll tell you, Anthony, there is uh, there's Colorado case law on this that says, you know, if the if it's if the search is limited intrusiveness, if it's made under arrest like circumstances, basically the arrestee knows what is happening and why there's California yeah. case law on this. And then there's one out of Idaho or Iowa. I don't remember. I apologize. But it it actually lays out very nice factors for it. And the Colorado right. ones are interesting because it says that it's actually like statutorily prohibited to make an arrest under circumstances like this. And so what are officers supposed to do? They're statutorily prohibited from making a custodial arrest. So they right. can incident to 
criminal citation. He, he, that's right. Now, actually, I will tell you this. Number one is, you know, you talked about de facto arrest. Try holding a person on the side of the road or at Walmart loss prevention office for three hours while a warrant is that that's a de facto right. arrest. So in effect, you, you've mm-hmm. arrested them anyway. But I will tell you that out of all these cases, Colorado is the most clear to me. They're the ones their Supreme Court is actually saying and, and they, they, you know, they call it a search. Um, they search incident to a non-custodial arrest. Right. Um, these other ones are more or less doing the balancing test based on the Fourth Amendment's re- ultimate reasonableness. Right. And I think that's really important for us to think about. It's like if you think about, hey, I'm just going to go into your backpack, recover the stolen property and kick you loose versus arresting you, keeping you. What's more reasonable to that person? Um, so, so I know that I, I know that the court will uphold it, but I'm telling you, man, even prosecutors are like, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know how we recover it, you know, without that arrest. And I'm like, okay, well then you argue to the judge that the alternative is just to make this arrest. Then that's, you have to arrest these people every single time, you know, if they don't let you into the backpack, which you may not be able to do. Right. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay. Go on. Right. Um, so John, John says, you receive a tip that an individual with an active arrest warrant was just seen at one of your local businesses um, next to a burgundy Chevy pickup. You go to the business, but the truck is gone. Caller advised they left westbound. You go westbound down the road a little ways and you see a truck matching this description pulling out of a gas station. You see the male passenger matches the description of the subject with a warrant and the truck is registered to his girlfriend's sister. Good for a Terry stop to identify. If the male refuses to identify, good arrest for the purpose of resisting arrest slash obstruction. Thanks in advance, Michigan, by the way. Um, yes, John, stop that vehicle. What, what what state is it? Michigan. Okay. Yeah, I mean, good all day, right? I mean, twice, twice on Sunday. I mean. Yeah, that's clearly reasonable suspicion, at least, to stop that vehicle and investigate. Yep. And then if the male subject matches the description... And you can confirm it, and he refusing to identify himself. Then you have a fair probability that he's a subject. You can arrest him. And so Jacob, Jacob wants to know again. He says, "The brother killed the brother. If you can't detain them, what do you do? You can try to silver tongue them, Jacob. Try to convince them that it's in their best interest to be witnesses. You can um, talk to the other family members and see if they will give you their contact information." and their name, date of birth at least. You can check public records of the house and see who the owners are. You can pull up their DMV photos and see if that's the person. And then you can give that information to your prosecutor and they can subpoena them. So can I, can I add something here? Yeah. Um, so this is another thing that, you know, um, that comes up and it's, you know, dealing with witnesses. And I, I like how you talk about the victimization, you know, witnesses are not, they're not criminals, right? So they, we're very limited, but I will tell you this. I, I think that there is a there is a, um, a support for the idea that if police are dealing with a a material witness, and when I say material, I'm talking about not the person you know that just saw somebody speeding through a, a neighborhood, right? We're talking about this is material. Like if you don't, if you do not have this person, you lose your case. The next one is that it is a very serious crime. This is only for the sexual assaults, the murders. The um the the drive bys you know and so forth, and then the, the the second the third thing is what I teach is to find some way to to identify them with you know hopefully your silver tongue will work but if they don't want to participate um find another way to identify them hopefully they drove in a car you can match the RO and finally if they are material and it's a very serious crime and you cannot live without this person there is an argument. There, and I and I talked to prosecutors about this. There is an argument that this may be obstruction, because sure. because they have no right to fifth to a Fifth Amendment privilege, right? So the Fifth Amendment doesn't come in, and the government has a has the authority to compel them to testify. And however, and in some states like California, New York, and so forth, do have material witness statutes. I was actually teaching. I'm teaching here in California right now. Um, the probation office actually puts GPS monitors on material witnesses. And did you know that? If they're, if they're not cooperative, yeah, if, if, if they have a material witness that's not cooperative, they the court will actually put a GPS monitor on. So they, they actually have ankle bracelets on witnesses. Um, but the reason that they have that is they have a material witness statute, which, of course, is rooted in Rico and the mob. You know what I mean? But they use it for these big murder cases. 
So I here's my at the end at the end of the day, guys, this is what I teach. I teach if you're in that situation, you cannot identify this person, but you know you let them go, you lose your case, call your prosecutor and ask them what to do. But don't let, you yeah, know, Arizona, before, is, uh, yeah. Arizona is hindering prosecution. There you go. So I think that there is an argument there. But man, I would tell you that this is one in a, in a career that just ever happened, that you are in that you're in a situation where you really can't identify somebody. You know what I mean? Um, and if you can identify them, you got to let them go. Would you agree? Kid, kid gloves. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead, John. I said kid gloves. Absolutely, kid gloves. gloves. Yep. yep, yep. All right. Um, I would love. I know there has to be somebody on this Zoom, on this this webinar that wants to actually ask a question over the uh, microphone. So, guys, Shane. let me just. Yeah. Who, who can we get on? Wanna, All right, get him on. Doc, you don't have a choice, Shane. <laughs> I'm just joking. You have a choice, Shane. Do you want to go live? He says he doesn't have a mic. Jeez. What was this, 1992? <laughs> Rick, send him a microphone. <laughs> All right. Shane says, partners detaining people leaving the home while Case Ace is writing a search warrant for a home, and it hits SWAT matrix based on history and weapons intel, which ultimately extends the duration of the search warrant. Are we good to hold on to them while waiting to secure the residence? Time frame was two to three hours. So yes, Shane, the answer is yes. You can detain people who have a nexus to the criminal activity at the home for a reasonable amount of time. We call these summers detentions. Well, are are we sure about this? Because you're you you might I always wondered about this, John. And yeah. are they are there, is it really a summers detention when the warrant has not been issued yet? Mm -hmm. I'm good with it. What I mean, do you think, Zach? I, I think it's just a, I think it's just a Terry stop. I mean, it it's. I, th I think the first question is, is how how solid are you on the probable cause for the warrant? Like, how certain are you that the warrant's going to be be issued? Um, and then, yeah, if there are people at the home, we have officers at the home uh, securing the, the, the residence in anticipation of this warrant's arrival. Yeah, I think under Terry, just general Terry principles, um, I think it's lawful to detain those people, uh, particularly if they have a nexus to the to the house uh, and the activity inside the house. Um, while we await the arrival of the warrant. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I, I actually, uh, what do you think about that, John? Do you think that Terry is, is a better analytical fit than maybe Summers? I just, isn't Summers really for the, because it says the execution of warrants, but we haven't, we're not executing anything yet. What do you think about that? But we're freezing the home in anticipation of getting a warrant, right? So yeah. we are in the warrant, we're in the warrant process. And, a, and the only reason why we would be doing this, the only reason why we would be freezing a home in anticipation of getting a warrant is if we're talking about a very serious crime where there's a significant governmental interest and we have clear PC and we have PC to believe that they are going to be destroying evidence or posing a risk of harm to officers. And so surveillance is um, infeasible. Right, right. So we may actually have PC to arrest them, you mean. In some cases, actually, that's another thing, right? I, I, I just, I think either way, we get them, right? So I think either way you call it a summer's detention or you call it a Terry detention, either way we win, I guess, right? Yeah, I think regardless of the reasoning, the result is the same. We get to keep them okay. there. Okay, cool. I like that. All right. What else we got, guys? We want we want to hear somebody else's voice, not just not just ours. Or we can go to the questions. All right, Josh, hold on. Let me find you, Josh. Hey, guys. Hey, Josh, how are you? Doing well, how are you? Awesome, man. Awesome. What do you got for us? Uh, so I have a, I guess, an inventory question. Uh, we had an officer got a uh, ALPR hit for a stolen license plate 
and the plate did not match the car. We found the car in a shopping mall parking lot, unoccupied, and determined that uh, the vehicle had never been registered um, and it had a confirmed stolen plate on the car. So we were gonna tow it back for an investigation to see if anybody would come forward with it and talk to him. Um, and before that, we did an inventory search of the car, but the car was locked. So we used lockout tools to get in the car before it got transferred over to our towing company to hold it in a secure area. And we had uh, a few bosses raised the question of unlocking the car to do the inventory before we uh, transferred it to our towing company. Okay, and so the question is, is if we're doing an inventory, if we're doing a valid inventory, and this is not for an investigatory purpose, can we unlock the car prior to doing the inventory? Yeah, so my argument was, well, we got to make sure that there is nothing dangerous in there um, that's getting transferred over with since we are the one requesting the tow and uh, it's being held in, in their secure lot. Yeah, that's not a that's not a problem at all. Um, your case on point here is South Dakota versus Opperman, and in that case, they actually I mean that's that's your that's your Supreme Court inventory case. In that case, they actually got a slim jim and unlocked the car. Right. So yeah, that, that's what I presented to them, and uh, still disagree. So I just want to get your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, I got no problem with it. The United States. Yeah. Supreme Precedent says we can do it, so I'm on board. Great. Wait, Thanks, wait, so, guys. Hey, real quick. Who, this, this, is this Josh? You said, yeah. Hey, what's up, brother? Hey, I'm going to hey. be in your neck of the woods tomorrow, by the way. I'm, I'm teaching in Aurora. Yeah, well, uh, we might be a, so, I think we're above freezing tomorrow, so it'll be all right. Good. Um, hey, so there's another case out there I was, I was going to try to look it up that actually also said that um, you should be inventorying cars if they're going to be released back, you know, the stolen cars. That yeah. you know, you should you know, hear actually the case. I don't know if it's let me see if what uh, uh, what state it is, but anyway, um, that you should be also inventorying cars, even if even if like even if before you release them back to the person, right? I mean, your your policy should should outline this, but like if I'm if my car's stolen and I come up on scene and you do not have to tow it, right? Um, police should also look through that car to make sure that the the thief is not leaving something dangerous in that car. So that's another communicate uh, community caretaking rationale, but. I don't know. Either way, I, I think we're good to go. Yeah, I think so, too. Okay. All right, cool. Awesome. All right, Steve. Steve's got something for us. Steve, are you there? All right. Can you do your mic, Steve, or you want to just, you don't have a mic. Okay. Steve says, so just confirming with everything being a sight out these days, if you know you have a crime, that's a sight out search incident to arrest won't apply for that. Right. So Steve, here's what we're going to say, man, right? Search incident to custodial arrest, search incident to arrest is I call it search incident to custodial arrest again, to drive home that point in people's minds is the reason why I'm doing that is to prevent people from gaining access to weapons, affecting means of escape or destroying evidence or introducing contraband into custodial facilities. And so if I'm not putting the person into a custodial facility, then the rationale for search incident to arrest largely fails. At least the bright line, you can just do it. No articulation is required. Um, what is that? Uh, is that Robinson or Chad? Rob Robinson. 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 Um, that just says, yeah, bright line rule, you can just do it um it doesn't apply but so then that creates the question that we are seeing more and more now is now we're not taking people to jail right now we're just writing people tickets and sending them on their way and saying please stop shoplifting in our store even though we know you're not going to um and so now we come into a legal issue where we say how do we get that stuff out of people's pockets and people say well i've got probable cause 
I got probable cause. To, I mean, the, the LP knows this guy's got the, pro the property in his pocket. And we say, yeah, but probable cause is the legal standard you have to meet. That's not what gets you into people's pockets. What gets you into people's pockets is the other recognized exceptions, such as search incident to custodial arrest. And so a lot of times we get hung up on this idea of search incident to citation. And so Anthony's argument is that, well, you need to make an exigency argument because exigency is a long recognized, recognized exception as far as destruction of evidence that goes, that allows these things, right? That allows these things to happen. And so I can make a limited, you know, minimally invasive search into that person's physical body, into their pocket, where I know what's in there. I'm going to tell them, hey, you are under arrest for shoplifting. Where is the stuff? Screw you, I ain't telling you nothing. LP says, yeah, this is what they stole and it's in their front right pocket, okay? You're in handcuffs. I'm going to go in, I'm going to remove those items and then I'm going to give you your criminal citation and I'm going to unarrest you and give you a kick in the ass and send you down the way, right? And then in my report, I am going to articulate that if the person was released without, you know, without recovering those items or if they were detained for X number of hours while I sought a search warrant, that would be an unreasonable, um, that would be an unreasonable amount of time. And so exigency for destruction of evidence necessitated that I reach in performing a minimally invasive search and remove those items to recover them, to return them to the victim. Heartache, anybody, we good? <laughs> it's, it's good and it's, it's great, John, it's great. And if the DA, if the prosecutor doesn't like it, you say, hey, what do you want me to do next time? You want me to just arrest them when it's against the statute? Do you want me to get a warrant? You want to wait there for three hours? What do you want me to do? You know what I mean? And let them come up with the answer. And, you know, they, the answer is what you just said. That's the most reasonable thing to do under the Fourth Amendment. There you go. And violations of state law don't make arrests illegal. So just arrest them and take them to jail, even though your statute says you can't. No, that's bad case law. Let's not do that. I just say everybody goes to jail. Take everybody to jail. I, I like that too. There you go. Especially when they don't want to. Especially when they, when they don't want to give you consent to return the property. That's. I mean, that's kind of fair. I wish they they should go to jail, but right. it's not an option in, in in places like Nevada and so forth. Okay. Don't come shoplift in my city. Go into those cities that won't take you to jail. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Hello, Kenneth. Hello, this is Maurice Jones and Ken is also present. We just had a question. Recently, we were uh, dispatched to a medical call uh, in our, our, our jurisdiction where there was a, a male, adult male uh, who was um, who was uh, had a bad reaction to using some uh, some drugs. And we went into the home with fire and EMS and uh, they were triaging the patient and in the meantime, my partner, who Ken, was the uh, primary officer, and I was just a cover officer. But while we were just talking to everyone in the home, we we came across some paraphernalia or um, uh, near the couch where one of the uh, where the victim's girlfriend was sitting in. Um, it's a single family home. The boyfriend of the mom of the patient was also there and he was the one providing these these drugs to the to the victim so we we noticed that um and so we just wanted to get your opinion on there uh, on that are we were we lawfully um are we lawfully able to use that uh to confiscate it to perhaps charge at a, a later time Yeah, I think your 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 entry is obviously cover, covered under the emergency aid exception, and I think the a limited search of the area inside the house to to help the uh, medics provide the emergency medical services, I think, would be uh, a, a lawful thing to do, a reasonable thing to do. And obviously, if something you discover in that course of action is leads to uh, incriminating evidence, there, then you're lawfully there. Uh, if it's in plain view then it, it can be seized. But yeah, I think the emergency aid exception covers covers the situation. Okay. Yeah, so yeah but don't, don't, don't forget Good Samaritan though. They may well, be immune. Yeah. They might be statute. immune in some states. Yeah. 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 So some states have statutes that say in this case, in a situation like that, if, if, that, if someone is called for medical help for that person or uh, then they're immune from prosecution for anything related to that substance. So yeah. But you need okay. to get with your you need to get with your prosecutors on that because that's going to be interpreting the state law, 
And so depending on how your state law, if you're, if you have a state law that, you know, we're legislate legislators are trying to encourage people to call 911 in overdose situations. And so we don't want to criminally prosecute people if they, we don't want to have a chilling effect on their calling police when, or when they're overdosing, because we don't want to, uh, you know, they don't want to be charged with it criminally. Um, but just understand that is not going to be applying in situations where an uninvolved party calls, right? So, you know, you got two situations, you got a family member calls in and says, hey, I discovered my child. And then you go in and you find out that somebody is supplying the child with these drugs. Um, the Good Samaritan law is probably not going to be applicable in that case for the supplier, right? Um, exactly. So, yeah, it just it just depends on who it is you are finding the information, who, who are you finding the evidence, who is it incriminating, who called you, why are you there? Um, that is questions that you have to answer to determine whether or not this Good Samaritan idea prevents you from criminal prosecution. Okay, thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, Shane found a mic. And then Amanda has a question also. Shane, did you dig that bad boy out of a, a box someplace? I did. Hopefully you can hear me. Oh, I can hear you, man. You oh, sound perfect. Clear. You sound clear. This must this must have been like a gaming headset. <laughs> I How wish. No. What do you got Just for some it? old school headphones? Um, so 911 hangups where um dispatch are calling them back. It's late at the night. You get there, it is an open door, but nobody is returning the phone calls. They just keep hanging up. Good to enter. And then another situation where there, there's no open door and they're refusing to come to the door. Okay. A big thing for me is is what's your what's your prior history at the house? Mm -hmm. And what's your prior history with that phone number? Okay. If there's any exigency with like screaming in the background or anything like that. I mean, you change my fashion, change my answer, man. You got screaming in the background, rock and roll. Right? You have mm -hmm. a specific, you know, I mean, you can you can articulate a reasonable belief that there is an emergency ongoing inside that house. Then yeah, you're good. You've got history with uh DV with the phone number, history with DV at the house. Um history with overdoses, you know, I mean, what is the history at the house? You guys, if you have no history there, that's a harder issue. Open door for me as a supervisor, I'm good. Make sure you are announcing, 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 announcing before making that entry. Closed door, no history. Repeated 911 hangups. Um, how certain am I it's coming from that house? You got to make that decision on, on scene. Zach, what do you think? Yeah, the, the I'm good with all of them except the, you know, the closed door. All we have is 911 hang up. You know, yeah, we want to try if it's obviously if it's from a cell phone, see if Zach, we can come Zach, to that you, house. Zach, are you good with going into the backyard and looking into windows? Um, yes, I think in a situation like especially the repeated 911 calls. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the limited intrusion into the curtilage, I think, is a reasonable first step. Okay. Uh, and that's if that is unproductive, and then we're thinking about going inside. Again, how certain are we that this call is coming from this house? Uh, and, all, and and that's all we have is the door is closed. We can't see anything from the outside. And then we become relatively certain it's from the house. I, I'm, I'd i make that call and say, go ahead, on, go check it out. Okay. And is there any new case law on any of this? Um, nothing Thanks. from the Supreme Court, obviously. Okay. But, um, you know, all of these are going to be very fact-specific situations. Okay. Um, uh, Shane. Yes. If you man, look up uh Del here, I'll 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 pop it in the I'll pop it in the chat right now. It's Delaware versus Garnett. It's a very recent case. I think it's very interesting. Um, and it's one that I, I teach sometimes when we talk about emergency aid, um, because I think that it it uh highlights the importance of making sure that everybody is on the same page as far as what it is you're doing there and why. Um, because in this case, there was absolutely a reasonable belief that there was an emergency occurring, but mm -hmm. the issue became uh, one of the supervisors on scene said, no, if, uh, if there was no answer, we would have just left. 
um, which is uh, extremely surprising for me, right? Because all the yeah. facts indicate that, no, we absolutely should go into this house. There was mm-hmm. an emergency going on. And in fact, they went in and found a, a female homeowner beaten to death. So okay, check that, check that case out. See if you can find that bad boy. Uh, it's an interesting analysis. Garnett versus Delaware. Thank you. Yep. All right. And then Amanda. Amanda, what do you got for us? I think you answered earlier, maybe a little bit, is the Cup versus Murphy. Um, can you search incident to arrest, take DNA, DNA swabs, seizing clothes and other items used in a crime if you don't have exigency? Say you have time to get a warrant that they don't know that they're suspected of this or that they're even on your radar as far as they're just here as a witness. Do you have time to get a warrant, should you? Well, yeah. So we're, it, okay. It, Go ahead, John. Yeah. I mean, you should always, if you, if you have time and there is no exigency, get a warrant, right? I mean, why would you ever not? It, you're, you're shifting the burden to the bad guy. You are, your search is presumptively reasonable. Um, the issue that I have is I don't know if you're ever going to be in that situation where there is no exigency. There is no concern about the destruction of evidence because obviously you have access to them. There's some place where they they know what they did. You know what they did, right? There's evidence on them. Um, and so I think that exigency is always going to exist there. Zach? I think you also can, if you're, this is just somebody we're, we're interviewing. We're, they're not under arrest, right, Amanda? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if I've got probable cause to believe the clothes they're wearing right now are evidence of the crime, then uh, there's, a, we could talk about the plain view doctrine. The evidence is in plain view. Um, obviously, we're not going to strip them naked in front of, you know, right there in a police station. We want to provide them with some clothing, but um, there's there's that argument. Uh, okay. If it's something like taking shoes off them, if we want to, if we want to take all of their clothes, um, you know, and they're not under arrest, I think probably a search warrant would be the absent some kind of threat that this is going to, this evidence is going to dissipate or they're going to destroy it while we're, we're rating the arrival of the warrant. But if we just want to take his shoes or something like that, um, I think the plain view doctrine would cover you there. I didn't even but- think about that. Thank you. And Zach, we're good to seize that stuff in anticipation and getting a warrant, right? I mean, that's what we're talking. Yeah, about. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah, absolutely. Which is what the plain view doctrine allows. The plain view doctrine allows you to seize things without a warrant, not to search things um, without a warrant. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I just have to say to Anthony, you absolutely traumatized your mom tonight by your comment about sex in public. <laughs> You can't see the comments. You've traumatized her. Oh, who 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 got traumatized? Yeah, because you cut off a little bit. My mom. Your mother. (laughs) Never knew. It's past your. Yeah, it's it's past your bedtime, mom. Go to bed. I'm gonna call the old folks home and let them know you're staying up late. (laughs) Anthony, go wait to his wedding. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> all right ryan ryan what do you got man hey guys can you hear me yep um first off real quick i just want to thank you guys um from jersey it's eleven fifteen at night um we're getting a little late but my question is so we obviously have search incident to arrest and everything like that but going on um a lot of our calls for service are based on medical um where we get the uh, the EMTs or ambulance to actually ask us to check a person for weapons or anything that they might be bringing into an ambulance before being transported. Um, Just more or less based on your experience or where you're from, um, what's your standing on that? I know our state is kind of frowned upon with it, but at the same time with the community caretaking and the exception of the safety of our EMTs, like I'm not going to say that we do it per se, but I think it's kind of necessary in that situation. And, and sometimes our states 
sides with the actual person and not our emergency medical technician. So I, I was just wondering what you guys think about that. I I, I got my answer. You want to hear my answer? Yeah. Sure. So are, this person, just to make sure we're on the same page, all this, all that's going on here is a person on a medical call is being transported. They are, they're not being uh, transported against their will. This is not a civil commitment. This is just a person having heart pain or heart, you know, uh, chest pain, and they want to go to the hospital, right? And we're asking, can we pat that person down before we go to the hospital? Is that, is that a good analogy or hypo? Yes. Um, to preface it, let's start with like the intoxication portion of it. Like a lot of the people we deal with are more or less too intoxicated to actually leave on their own. Um, and that's why okay. they're being in the hospital. All right, good. Look, I, I want to, I want to, uh, uh, my answer is going to change then. Okay. Let's first start with the baseline. We have people that are taking a public ambulance, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going, they're going to the hospital because of a medical condition. The answer is absolutely not. The government's not going to put, you know, I'm just, I'm passionate. The government cannot put hands on those people simply because they have chosen to take a ride on a public ambulance. I think we'd agree on that, right? Because there is no law enforcement reason to put hands on them. And if the EMTs don't, they want you to do it, then I, that's not, we, you know, that's a, that's a search under the Fourth Amendment, right? It's, so we can't do it. They can do whatever they want. I mean, let them, they have their own policies. But would you agree with that, right? As a baseline thing, simply taking a ride in a public ambulance does not warrant a pat down. Would you agree with that? I would, I agree. I agree. What, what about the caller? Do, does, does the caller agree? My, my officer in New Jersey? Do you agree with that premise? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I just think a lot of times when we get that call, it's more based on like a third party call um, where yep. maybe a neighbor or something like that's walking down the street. And we have reason to believe like, OK, they may not be carrying a weapon, but they might be a danger to the ambulance with anything they may have on them. And that's that's more or less why our EMTs kind of ask for that. Um, OK, again, our so we're, not, we're not, not conformed to that. Right. Well, look, so there, there's two different things. Though. I just want to make sure they're on the same page like. I just want to make sure that cops that are listening to this are not getting this idea that we can just pat people down because they're they're being transported for a medical condition as a, as a matter of routine. That that cannot happen, right? And I can you can you know you would be if I got transported in an ambulance and somebody put hands on me and start searching me, I'd be like for what? You know what I mean? I'm not what? Why are you putting you know why are you searching me for weapons? Now the ambulance providers, you know whatever they want to do, that's we're, we don't we don't represent them. So the second thing is. The guy that's intoxicated, I do believe that you could at least pat him down. And the reason, and the, and you said he's being, he's is this kind of like a, uh, like he's being, he's going to be dr uh, drying out, right? He's going to be taken because he can't care for himself. Is that is that the the rule here? Yes. Okay, I think we can pat them down as a matter of routine. And the reason why is the government's you, ambulance, whoever is taking custody of that person to some degree. In many states, that actually is in line with an arrest, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an involuntary uh, hold, right? The person is not necessarily saying that they want to be the hell. They might be saying the opposite, that they don't want to go to the ambulance or to the hospital or the, uh, wherever you guys drive people out. Would that be a true statement? Absolutely. So look at it from that point of view, the government is actually seizing that person. And now we can start doing the regular rules pat down you may even be able to do a full-blown search i know we can do a full-blown search for uh civil commitments right because civil commitments are actually arrests under the constitution the people that are being dry drying out i think what's fair and what's reasonable is at least a pat down that's that's my position i like to hear what john and zach have to say on that one. i think they're all the functional equivalent of an arrest um and i think the a custodial arrest um, and I think at the end of the day, you could probably we could justify the full search incident to arrest. But I think some some probably a little bit of um, restraint might be appropriate, like just patting them down for weapons. If all he is, he's intoxicated. He's going to go, you know, sit in the drunk tank for a couple hours and we let him go. Um, I think just a pat down might just be sufficient. But they're functionally the equivalent of an arrest for Fourth Amendment purposes. was a uh, recent case a guy was in custody i believe and he was in the hospital 
and a nurse requested the officer check his clothing for narcotics and he searched his clothing and found narcotics and the court suppressed it um, because they said that wasn't a valid search incident to arrest applying Gantt. He was uh, secured to a hospital bed and so he didn't have access to the clothing. Um, you know, I mean, that just kind of shows this trend that we're seeing in some courts to search incident to custodial arrest and uh, how it's no longer a bright line rule, at least at the lower court levels, although the United States Supreme Court still holds it as a bright line rule um, in non-vehicular situations. I'm saying Arizona versus Gantt is vehicular only. Mm -hmm. um, that's my interpretation. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the governmental interest versus the infringement on the individual's rights. And we need our healthcare professionals, we need our ambulance drivers, we need our EMTs to be safe. And so if you can give me a basis to believe that this person has contraband or weapons on him, then no one is going to fault you for that. And at the end of the day, if the evidence does get suppressed, I'm not, you know, standing by while a knife, you know, a knife gets stuck in the throat of a nurse. Fair enough, guys. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Zach, you got any final thoughts for us? Uh, no, I really enjoyed the reasonable suspicion presentation. I thought you did a phenomenal job, and I, I thought we had a bunch of really good questions tonight. Appreciate everybody um, stay, staying up late. I'm out here on the East Coast, too. It's getting close to 1130, so uh, um, it's been a good evening. Wonderful. Yes, thank you guys very much. We love the engagement. We love the interaction. We love the participation. Um, makes it all worth it. Anthony, what final words of wisdom do you have for us, sir? Nothing. He was the first one to sign off. Hey, hey sign guys. <laughs> <ice. laughs> all right, guys. Blue to gold.com slash show. Blue to gold.com slash show if you ever have any questions or blue to gold.com slash trainings. Zach's got some good ones coming up. I've got some good ones coming up. Please come out, see us in person. If you like the online stuff, I tell you the in-person stuff is even better. We'd like to see you there. All right. Be safe out there, guys. Take care. Take care.